Bacteria are tiny single-celled organisms and they're everywhere. They're on your phone, they're on your skin, they're bouncing around in the air, they're in your gut. You may actually have more bacterial cells in your body than human cells. They're sorted into different groups based on their shapes and whether they stick together, but you know, don't worry about that. Most of the time they just sit around minding their own business, but occasionally some pathogenic bacteria get together and start causing trouble, so they must be eliminated. Antibiotics are very good at this. For a substance to be a decent antibiotic, it has to be extremely toxic to bacteria, either killing them or stopping them from reproducing. Not only that, it has to be extremely toxic to bacteria without being very toxic to us. Alcohol is very good at killing bacteria, but obviously you couldn't just fill your veins with alcohol to try and clear an infection because that'd kill you first. Fire is amazing at killing bacteria, but it's also amazing at killing humans. So what a lot of antibiotics do is target something you find in bacterial cells, but not in animal cells. For example, bacteria are held together by outer cell walls, and the most common class of antibiotics works by breaking these cell walls down. Animal cells don't have these walls, so they're fine. There are other ways for antibiotics to work, but the goal is always the same, to kill bacteria without killing us. If you want to take them by mouth, they also have to be able to survive your stomach and intestines and be absorbed into your blood. If you have an infection in your lungs, an antibiotic that gets destroyed in your stomach or hangs around in your gut and then gets deposited in the toilet isn't much use. Nitrofurantoin is pretty good at killing a number of bacteria, but it doesn't hang around in the blood. It gets filtered out by the kidneys almost immediately and gets deposited in the bladder. So we use it to treat bladder infections, but nothing else. But why do we need all these antibiotics anyway? Why not just pick a nice broad spectrum antibiotic and use it for everything? This is where the problem of resistance comes in. When we're thinking about resistance, it's important to remember how natural selection works. Let's say some evil aliens arrived on Earth and deployed a load of invisible robots to hit every human in the head with a hammer with no warning. Humans might go extinct, but might not. There are seven billion of us, and we're all a bit different. There's a decent chance some people with harder than average skulls might survive. Then these people, being the only ones left, would gradually repopulate the Earth and pass their harder skulls onto their children. And if the aliens came back every so often to hit everyone in the head with a hammer again, eliminating anyone who hadn't inherited the hard skull, eventually Earth would be full of people with harder skulls than before. Humans would have evolved thicker, harder skulls, not because anyone decided to, but because the aliens got rid of anyone whose skull was weak and comparatively pathetic. Now this would take a long, long time, because there are about 20 years between human generations. But this is effectively what we're doing with bacteria, and some bacteria reproduce every 20 minutes. Occasionally a bacterium comes along that just happens to survive in the presence of an antibiotic. Maybe its cell wall is harder to penetrate, or maybe it secretes an enzyme that destroys the antibiotic. The antibiotic kills most of the bacteria, and hopefully the patient's own white blood cells come along and get rid of any left over, but there is a chance a few might survive. Then, left with loads of space to themselves, these ones go forth and multiply. This is helped by the fact that bacteria can swap DNA between individuals. We can't do this, we pass genes on to our children, but I can't go to a taller friend and ask him to teach me how to be tall. Bacteria can pass resistance genes around, almost like learning from one another. But not really, because bacteria can't think. So hospitals are places where lots of antibiotics have been in use for the last 70 years. They're full of open wounds and immunocompromised people who sometimes die. This makes them breeding grounds for these superbugs, bacteria which have gained resistance to one antibiotic after another over time. So doctors do have really effective broad-spectrum antibiotics in reserve, but they don't just throw them at every infection that comes in the door. They don't want to encourage resistance to these antibiotics of last resort. Superbugs like this aren't more likely to make you sick. You might have MRSA hanging around in your nose right now, not causing any trouble. It's just that if you do get sick from something like MRSA, it's harder to treat. So it's important for visitors to hospitals and people who work in hospitals to wash their hands. A lot. So why aren't pharmaceutical companies researching more new antibiotics? because they'd have a very hard time selling them. As soon as a new antibiotic became available, everyone would say, fantastic, nobody use it. It had become an antibiotic of last resort by default. We would want to keep it in reserve for when bacteria became resistant to all the antibiotics we have already. Antibiotic development might be one of those areas where it's appropriate for big government to mess around with the free market. It was suggested to me once that honey is a natural antibiotic because it can be used as an antiseptic wound dressing. Most bacteria don't survive very well when they're covered in honey. This isn't surprising. Most living things wouldn't survive for very long completely immersed in honey, including snails, trees, fish, and you. That doesn't translate to any effect once the honey is swallowed. Honey probably won't look much like honey anymore within a few seconds of making it to your stomach. However, there is the matter of the magic honey from New Zealand. Manuka honey contains at least one compound which is very toxic to most bacteria and possibly some others which are anti-inflammatory. Sterile Manuka honey is sold in wound dressings, and one study found that only a 5% solution of Manuka honey was enough to stop the bacteria which cause stomach ulcers from growing in a petri dish over three days. Does that mean that Manuka honey will cure stomach ulcers? Dunno. 
Depriving me of oxygen would kill me, but it wouldn't kill me in 10 seconds. It'd take a few minutes. It'd take a few days to kill me by depriving me of water. We don't know how long you'd have to maintain an appropriate manuka concentration in your stomach to have any effect. If you had an ulcer below your stomach, in your small intestine, would the manuka stick around for long enough to be effective, regardless of how much you ate? Would you have to sit around eating nothing but manuka honey for a day? What about two days? How much would you have to eat at a time? Could we isolate the antibacterial ingredient in manuka honey and just take that? Does it survive your stomach? Does it get absorbed into your blood? There are loads more questions. But surely a bit of manuka honey can't hurt. It can hurt your wallet.